It is no secret that we pick up excess spiritual baggage as we go through life. Whether we can get rid of the baggage and get to the truth will determine whether or not we come into God's kingdom. Come, let us dig into God's word, which is truth. Welcome to Ephraim's Light Assembly. The following podcast is from our teaching series on Genesis. It is November 11, 2023. My name is Doris Smith, announcer for Ephraim's Light Assembly. Before you listen to today's message, we strongly suggest that you read in your Bible Genesis chapter 23, verse 1, to Genesis chapter 25, verse 18, because that is the portion of Scripture this message comes from. Now let us join our Pastor Frank Smith with a teaching message entitled, Pro sin is pro death. Look alive. It is the Sabbath and God has requested our presence with him. I want to welcome everybody to this week's teaching. We're in Genesis chapter 23 verse 1. We're going to study through Genesis 25 verse 18. And it's about the life and times of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, the title of our message is pro sin is pro death. And I want you to consider this particular passage in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The person who sins is the one that will die. A son is not to bear his father's guilt with him, nor is the father to bear the son's guilt with him, but the righteousness of the righteous will be his own, and the wickedness of the wicked will be his own. However, if the wicked person repents of all the sins he committed, keeps my Torah, and does what is lawful and right, then he will certainly live. He will not die. None of the transgressions he has committed will be remembered against him, for the righteousness that he has done, he will live. Do I take any pleasure at all in having the wicked person die? Ask Adonai Elohim. Wouldn't I prefer that he turn from his ways and live? On the other hand, When the righteous person turns away from his righteousness and commits wickedness by acting in accordance with all the disgusting practices that the wicked person does, will he live? None of the righteous deeds he has done will be remembered for the trespass and sins he has committed, he will die. And folks, I want to start today letting you know that there are a number of advantages of studying your Bible using the methods we give you. It will make you an independent thinker, one in touch with God at a personal level. And this will benefit you in all the decisions you make every day that affect you and your family physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. It will make you a leader, an innovator, one more adapt to responding to life. Education's great, but you got to always remember that there can always be a better way of doing things. When it comes to Bible study, Studying Calvin, Pink, Wesley, Luther, and all the rest has a benefit. However, their challenges in life are the same as yours. They put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. They had marital problems, financial problems, social problems, just like you face every day. What I am saying is to prove everything because you may be able to improve upon it. Investigate everything. Don't take somebody else's word for things, not even mine. Study a principle in your Bible until you can find those three witnesses needed to confirm that principle. Let God prove it to you through his scripture. Be open to the Holy Spirit to speak to you from within. Just make sure you confirm whatever that voice is telling you is in the word of God. If you can't, you're hearing some other spirit, not God's spirit. Do these things and study your Bible and the benefits of this concentrated Bible study you will do will benefit your entire life. Now let's be guided into today's message by reflecting on last week's teaching in which we received a greater understanding of the tools that we use in these teachings to unveil God's character. As a follow-up, I want to tell you that when we teach, we must, in every passage, look for the character of God and glimpses of the Messiah who has been with God before the foundation of the earth and long before our creation. 
The Messiah, you see, is the right arm of God, and he's been active in the affairs of men since before the beginning. Listen, God's wisdom is progressive. He created man and he staged him in the Garden of Eden to be fully independent upon God. Man rebelled, separating himself from the Creator and was sentenced to struggle for his existence instead of God providing it for him. This was the beginning of God's 7,000-year restoration plan to bring us back to the beginning. As we progress toward our rendezvous with the beginning, God continues to unveil more and more of his wisdom. We know vastly more now than 10 years ago, and in the years to come, God is going to unveil more to those who love him. The Torah, the wisdom of God, captured in the first five books of the Bible, reflects the very nature of God, and it is infinite just as he is infinite. Do you think that 1,000 years of Torah teaching will be sufficient? No, it is not, and I'll tell you why. You don't graduate from Torah because it's a lifestyle. Yeshua is coming to write it on our hearts, not to offer some course where we can say, I have graduated. Overcoming the flesh is the goal and requires a continual maintenance of God's principles. And as I said, the Torah of God is like God, it is infinite. We will be studying and living by the Torah of God for eternity because it is infinitely deep. It is God's way which is eternal. The portion of scripture we study today features two things, Sarah's son, Isaac, and her burial. It is unique in that it does not talk about the life of Sarah, but about the events that happened after her death. Her life was all about her son. Her death was over the anguish that her son nearly died in the Akedah, which is the binding of Isaac. So one of the first questions that arises is, why was Sarah not able to bear the thought of her son nearly being sacrificed? Abraham carried out the process of binding his son for sacrifice because he knew he was doing God's will and that God could resurrect him. Some say he did it with joy, but how can that be? That's kind of hard to imagine. Let's cover a couple of things before we move forward with the story of Sarah. Well, the problem with understanding Abraham's faith is we think like Greeks in the concrete, the black and white. In Greek thought, death is associated with the end, a permanent absence from the physical life and judgment. But God's thinking and our reality is abstract. Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 10. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. You can just see in this passage how God's organized, purposeful mind formulated creation. From his thoughts and plans, he spoke the world into existence. As we've talked recently, we must retrain our minds to think in the abstract, to think more like God. In Greek thinking, the human world is filled with sorrow, struggle, and guilt. Evil abounds in our world, and God tells us man's rules ends in horrible evil, such as the world has never experienced before. Matthew 24, verse 21 for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. The key to Abraham's joy then was that he trusted God. Let me explain. Joy in Hebrew is the word simket. In Hebrew thought, joy is a manifestation of divine purpose fulfilled. In God's kingdom, everything he made has a purpose. Whenever any part of the creation acts according to its design, that part expresses and experiences Simket, 
joy. Therefore, Abraham was joyful that he and his son could fulfill their purpose. There is a greater joy in life fulfilling God's purpose than all the physical pleasures of our world. I was once piloting a very expensive aircraft for a man. We were en route from Oklahoma to Florida on a clear, beautiful day, which was like sitting in an easy rocking chair at 34,000 feet. The man looked at me and he said, I don't understand. I own multiple aircraft, two car agencies, have four homes in three states, a wife and a girlfriend, and I'm not happy. You sit here with practically nothing and you're as happy as you can be. You see, folks, he never understood. I had more than he had. I had fulfillment of purpose. This is wisdom beyond the understanding of the world. It is wisdom in the understanding of God. Listen, we cannot have faith if we think and act like the world. We must operate in the spiritual world to have faith. As we said before, you cannot think of Abraham without thinking of faith because faith is is truly trusting God. I hope you're listening because it's going to improve your life. Abraham's trust in God gave him the strength to negate the physical world and transcend the normal physical existence. He was able to live in the spirit more than in the physical. God put man here on earth to have dominion over the earth. He instructed man to go forth and subdue the earth for the kingdom of God, for the creator. Sarah's focus was to serve God in the world, making it hard for her to understand the transcendental relationship between the physical and spiritual worlds, yet she was a pure and righteous person. Sarah brought spiritual power into the physical world. Most people struggle with understanding serving God as though we are in the spiritual world while still in the physical world. And that is what Paul was talking about in his letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Work willingly as slaves, as people do who are serving not merely human beings, but the Lord. Remember that whoever does good work whether he be a slave or a free man, will be rewarded by the Lord. Now, as far as Sarah was concerned, she was not interested in seeing her son sacrificed and his soul move into the spiritual realm. She, like all mothers, was a co-creator with God and interested in promoting the spiritual person in the physical world. Last week, we talked about using the method of Pardee's to see the things that God has hidden in the scriptures for us to find. Hidden themes, concepts, and principles are embedded in all scripture, and it takes spiritual eyes and a knowledge of scripture to see them. In this case, these two elements of Sarah's life represent the people of Israel and the land of Israel. To understand more fully, we must know about the restoration of Israel. To do that, we have to go over things that we've been over before because we always have new people joining and we want them to understand the biblical foundation of what we're talking about. Israel are God's chosen people. Do not mistake them for Jews. For Jew means Judah. And that describes the three southern tribes of Israel, Judah, Benjamin, and part of Levi. That is called the house of Judah. Jesus was of the house of Judah, being described as the lion of the house of Judah. Just to put it bluntly, Yeshua was not a blue-eyed surfer from California. He was a serious Jewish rabbi. Indeed, if you obey the commandments of God, you're going to be like Jesus. You will obey the commandments of God and behave like a Jewish rabbi. The evil one is the opposition. He's tried to convince you otherwise. There is no other way to put it. Anti-Semitism, which is in the news all the time now, is something called the world's oldest hatred. Why? Because the evil prince of this world struggles for power, and the only way he can get it is to dupe God's people who have the real power into giving it to him. God's people deny him and separate themselves from the culture of the world and obey God's commandments. 
This vividly describes the war between good and evil. You know, God's people do not syncretize with the religious and social customs of their conquerors. No matter whether free or slave, we remain steadfast in the principles of God. Judah, the southern tribes of Israel, has been charged by God to preserve, defend, protect, and teach God's will and constitution, called the Torah, all the commandments of the Bible, which are contained in the first five books of the Bible. But Judah is only part of the whole house of Israel. There are ten northern tribes in Israel, and the largest is Ephraim. These nine tribes plus the other part of Levi make up, get this, listen to me now, the house of Israel. The house of Israel, known as the lost sheep of the house of Israel, were scattered into the nations in 721 B.C. for violating the constitution of God. They are lost, under a curse, wandering, hidden in the nations. God has sworn by himself that he will regather them, retrain them in his constitution, the Torah, and reunite them with Judah. He's going to make the whole house of Israel whole again. This newly formed coalition, rising from the ashes of history, will be the pure bride of Christ. Now, all of those guys I told you about that wrote all those commentaries and all those wonderful things about Christianity, they lived in the past. Right now, this newly formed coalition, rising out of the ashes of history, as I said, it's happening now because the curse of Ephraim's separation and disobedience came to an end in approximately the year 2007. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yes, he was speaking of the house of Israel that's today mixed with the nations, but now in the process of being grafted back into God's kingdom, Israel. Paul said in Romans 11 that when we accept Yeshua as Lord and follow his commandments, we are grafted into the house of Israel the tree. God is calling with a loud and clear voice in these last days of Satan's rule. Revelation 18 verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. So with all that understanding, let's rejoin the story of Sarah, Abraham's wife. She died at age 127, a righteous person all of her life, like a spiritual virgin and great prophetess. Abraham found the perfect spot to honor her life. It was in Hebron in a cave there called Machpelah where he would bury her. It was a cave with two chambers and over the years more chambers were added. What we're learning about this area has been passed down from the sages in Israel's archives. Machpelah in Hebron, also known as the Cave of Four, lies 19 miles south of Jerusalem in Hebron in what is now the West Bank, an area of hills and valleys. Adam, Isaac, Jacob, and later Abraham were buried there together with their wives Eve, Rebekah, Leah, and Sarah. Noteworthy is the fact that it also had four names, Kiryat Arba, meaning the city of Arba, and it was later Kerjoth Arba, as depicted in the complete Jewish Bible. Abra was the name of an influential man in the area. It was also known as Mamre, which you may remember is where Abraham had his encounter with the heavenly visitors after circumcision. Interestingly, the word Zakin Mamre would mean a rebellious leader. Zakin is an elder, and Mamre means rebellious. So when the spies of Moses went through Canaan, Hebron was called Ishkol, and it was known for the grapes of Ishkol the spies reported on. Today, and when Abraham buried Sarah there, it was known as Hebron, which, like the Spanish word Javier, means friend. 
These names of Hebron represent different types of death. Sometimes when people die, it's because of their own sin. This is a memory or rebellious type of death. Concerning the death of Sarah, memory is not used. Eshkol refers to the type of death in which men die for the sins of others. In other words, their forefathers. They don't repent for and overcome the sins of their forefathers going back four generations. Therefore, they die because of their ancestors' sin, which continues in their lives. So what's the significance about Kiryat Arba? The Kiryat Arba death is from the natural deterioration of the body and the soul's longing to depart to be in the proximity with its source, the Lord, our Creator. In Sarah's case, she didn't die from her own sin. She didn't die from anybody else's sin. Through the process of believing her son would be sacrificed, she had lost her will to live. Her body was still youthful, but her soul desired to depart. And this is why the scriptures first say that she died in Kiryat Arba or Hebron. Her death was the result of desiring to be with God. Abraham was with her, and she knew that Isaac was saved and had gone on to study the Torah in the house of study of Shem, who was Melchizedek and Eber. Both Abraham and Isaac were trained by Melchizedek for the priesthood. But Melchizedek lived ten generations past the flood and past the priesthood to Jacob, whose name was changed, as you may remember, to Israel. The priesthood was then passed from Jacob to Levi. So now just remember, in the Hebrew abstract view, death is coming face to face with you. That's panim to panim as a friend and kissing you, taking back the breath, the Neshima breath of life that he gave you when you were born and you die in complete peace. This is reflected in the name Hebron, which means friend. This is how Sarah died and her spirit returned to the Lord. When there's death, we're normally grief-stricken first. We weep, then we mourn their passing. In the case of Abraham, the scripture tells us, he mourned her death, then he was grief-stricken. To mourn means to eulogize in the original language, and Abraham did that first in reverse of what is normal. There are no accidents in the Torah, so why was the process described in the Torah in the beginning? It was because Sarah was a righteous person. Abraham spoke of her good before he grieved to let the world know of her righteousness. That's what was important. In the sentence where you read about this, there is an anomaly that we need to pay attention to. It's in the small letter, cough, in the word weep. Now, the angels were watching Abraham to see how he handled this final test, the death of his wife. Although his grief was great, he reduced his public mourning in Sarah's honor so that the people would remember how she lived rather than his mourning. Sarah's name means princess, and she was indeed like a princess of our God most high and of mankind. The sages tell us that miracles occurred in the tent of Abraham during her life. At sundown Friday night, the woman of the house lights a candle and everyone gathers around the table to eat and talk about Scripture and to pray. The candle from the eve of Shabbat is never snuffed out or blown out, signifying that God's light in our life never goes out. We are to let it burn until it goes out on its own. Now here's the miracle. Sarah's candle miraculously stayed lit from one Friday Shabbat, that's Friday night sundown, from that until the next. In addition, Sarah always took some of her dough for the meal. She always blessed it and made it an offering to the Lord. The dough for her cooking in preparation for the Sabbath meal was blessed and always sufficed for the family and guests. She always had enough dough. 
like the basket of the five loaves and the two fishes that Yeshua blessed when he fed the 5,000, the dough for her challah, that's bread, just kept on producing. In Jesus' day, they gathered 12 baskets of food after everyone had eaten their fill that was from those five loaves and two fishes. Now, attached to Sarah's tent was a divine cloud, the same one that accompanied Israel through the wilderness, veiling God's Shekinah glory, was always attached to her tent. Now, when Sarah died, all these phenomena ceased. Abraham knew from his years of study with Melchizedek where Adam, Isaac, and Jacob were buried, so he fought hard to make sure that he gained title to the land so that he and his descendants could be buried there also. The result was the first land deed title transfer in all of Scripture or in the history of the world, according to archaeologists. Now, right now, that place in Hebron, that cave, is the most highly contested piece of dirt on the planet because the Arabs claim right to it and that the Jews have no right to it. They claim they own the cave. We know better because Scripture just told us that Abraham bought it. Genesis 23, 7 through 9. Abraham got up, bowed before the people of the land, the sons of Het, and spoke with them. If it is your desire to help me bury my dead, then listen to me, he said. Ask Ephraim, the son of Zohor, to give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns, the one at the end of his field. He should sell it to me in your presence at its full value, then I will have a burial site of my own. Now Abraham fought to purchase the land even though they wanted to give it to him. But upon learning that Abraham insisted on purchasing the ground, the seller changed value on him, saying it was worth a, get this, mere 400 shekels. Now, for comparison, Scripture tells us that land was going for 17 shekels per acre in those days, and you could buy an ox for 30 shekels. Even a virgin bride was only worth 100 shekels. As a friend of mine once said, make your money off your friends, your enemies aren't going to let you. Abraham paid the price. God has to make sure that his chosen people own the land that is his. David bought the Temple Mount, for example, for 50 shekels. Genesis 23, 17 and 18. So the field of Ephron was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which was all in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went in at the gate of his city. And this is why God will return Hebron to Israel eventually. They have a legal deed to it per God's holy scriptures. So Abraham buried his wife Sarah there in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. Then our story changes focus. Abraham began to think about future generations, and he sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac. God's instructions were that Abraham's descendants marry within the house of Israel, which verifies what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, and that is this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness and lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, the evil inclination, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols, for you are the temple of the living God. Do not be unequally yoked. Do not have a personal relationship with an unrighteous person. The scripture says that Abraham sent the servant that had served him the longest to find a bride for Isaac. Now, it doesn't mention the servant's name, but we know it was Eliezer. The Torah always has a reason for what it says. It omits Eliezer's name so that we can make parallels from this passage. 
this passage is a picture of God sending out his Holy Spirit to prepare his bride. Note that Eliezer was not a Jew, but a Gentile grafted into Israel. The sages teach that this Eleazar was the Rosh Yeshiva in Abraham's household, and that means he was the Torah teacher of Abraham's family and all of his servants. Who better to be used by God to bring about the very promises of the covenant? We receive the eternal blessings of the covenant by exercising the same faith which Abraham himself had in the Messiah. Jesus said in John 8, 56, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and he was glad. This reality should alert us to the fact that genuine faith in Yeshua cannot be separated from covenant membership in Abraham's covenant. And this is why Paul said in Romans 4 that Abraham is the father of all who believe. It is in this context that non-Jews are grafted into the tree Israel. Folks, I want you to think for yourself. Every denominational church out there with all their various and different teachings believes they are the bride of Christ. Now let me just ask you, would God choose a schizophrenic bride? No. No. The father will choose a bride for his son who reflects the standards and the teachings of the father. In that day, Abraham's day, it was a custom for those swearing an oath to slide their hand under the thigh of the person that they are making the oath to and make the declaration. Under the thigh is where the person's seed is housed, and by making the oath in this manner, the person is swearing to them and their descendants. It was custom. Eliezer did this and had specific questions as to how he was going to go about this search. What he found out was the wife for Isaac was not to come from the Canaanites, but from the kinsmen of Abraham. Abraham didn't want his son to go to that part of Canaan. The Canaanites had not followed Abraham in taking the land that God had promised him, and they were way north in what is now Lebanon, so it was going to be a long trip for Eliezer. Now Abraham revealed that the angel of the Lord would go before Eliezer and guide him to find this wife for Isaac. I wonder who that angel was. I'll let you think about it. So out of the ancient text, we can learn of our responsibilities for today. The focus is shifting from Sarah to the righteous bride of Israel to the next righteous bride, a descendant of the covenant, a symbol of you and I today who love the Lord and keep his commandments. We are the descendants of Israel, and we are to be an example of Israel. We know that there was no one to be found in the land as righteous as Rebekah, whom the angel of the Lord found. Folks, if you have a soul, that is, if you can communicate with your soul, you must be about following the example of ancient Israel. You can say you're pro-Israel. You can send money to support Israel. You can side with Israel. But the proof that you're in God's covenant is whether or not you are willing to be taught the Torah by our older brother Judah. Are we willing to return to the ancient paths of the principles of God laid down for Israel? We need to be the bride that Israel was without the occasional errors that they made to get them in hot water with God like idol worship, sexual sin, and spiritual adultery of which America is full. Abraham was sincere and committed in allowing God to select a bride for his son at this point. He was so sure, he told his servant, that if the woman would not come with him, he would be released from his oath. Now Eliezer took a show of wealth with him to present to Abraham's brother Nahor and his family in his quest for a bride for Isaac. Ten camels were loaded down. Note that Eliezer was in constant communication with God as he traveled to Hebron. Eliezer said, Adonai has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. He was always in a listening mode as he traveled 
Folks, that's a lesson for us. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in Adonai with all of your heart and to not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Now, when Eleazar neared the area in Hebron, it was evening when the daughters would go to the well to get water for their families. Eleazar put out his fleece to the Lord, saying, which recorded in Genesis 24, 12 through 14, Adonai, God of my master Abraham, please let me succeed today and show your grace to my master Abraham. Here I am, standing by the spring, as the daughters of the townsfolk come out to draw water. I will say to one of the girls, please lower your jug so that I can drink. If she answers, yes, drink, and I will water your camels as well, then let her be the one you intend for your servant Isaac. And this is how I will know that you have shown grace to my master. Now I want to make these points. Eliezer knew God was in charge. He knew to put his plan before the Lord and then depend on him, not himself, to select Isaac's wife. The scripture tells us that immediately Rebekah came and when Eliezer spoke to her, she did exactly and said exactly what Eliezer asked as a sign from the Lord. You know, just a thought. Those contemplating marriage in our day should try putting their fleece before the Lord like Eliezer and let him select their marriage partner. If they would do this, they could avoid a lot of personal strife in life and the divorce rate would plummet. So now upon finding that she was a descendant of Nacor, Eliezer bowed his head and gave honor to Adonai. The first thing that Eliezer looked for was a selfless person, one willing to give of what they have. That, my friends, will be the main characteristic of the bride of Christ, one who is selfless, one willing to go above and beyond to care for others. Yeshua said in Luke chapter 6, verse 30, Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Matthew chapter 5, verses 40 through 45. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So, let's think about this. If a man asks you for a drink of water, Ask him if you can water his dog also. For if he asks money for food, pay for a meal. This is what the Spirit of God is looking for in the bride of Christ, a giver, someone who cares about others, excited to do God's will. Folks, you know what this is called? Tekum Olam, repairing the world. Now, Rebekah's brother Laban, upon hearing of all that had taken place between Eliezer and Rebekah, he ran to meet Eliezer at the well and invited him into their home. Laban saw that the animals were taken care of and that there was the customary washing of feet. Then they sat down for the meal. But Eliezer would not eat until he had delivered the message sent from his master. He took care of his master's business first. He explained the wealth of Abraham and that he was sparing no expense at finding his son a godly wife and preparing her to meet and return with Eliezer. The bride was being prepared by the servant for the son. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. We know the bride is a spiritual virgin, we know that she must be selfless, and according to 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, she must be pure. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as as our Lord Jesus Christ is pure. Isaiah chapter 63, verses 3 through 5. For as a young man marries a virgin, 
so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Listen, our sanctification is to make us pure. It's not just something God had us go through. It's not a religious thing, but it's a process that has a divine purpose. For the bride must be pure. Also, the bride must be a part of Israel. You can say you're a Christian and that's all right. You can go to church and that's all right. But if you're not grafted into Israel and seeking to be obedient to God's commandments, you will not be a part of the bride of Christ. You see, the bride of Christ, according to Scripture, will be pure without spot nor wrinkle. The Torah is the iron for her. If you don't believe in the Torah and live by it, you can say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name and do mighty works in your name? But if you do not have the Torah, you will not be the bride of Christ. Folks, this is that important. This story is a picture of the end time bride at the foot of Mount Sinai. Anyone who desires to obey God's commandments and has their testimony in Yeshua will be grafted into the bride. A woman who tries to get access to the husband without being a bride is called a harlot. Many will say, Lord, Lord, in that day to no avail because they're not a part of the bride. Christ will say, I never knew you because you did not keep the betrothal covenant. It is the ones who are keeping themselves chaste and drawing near to God, obeying his covenant promises that are the bride. The bride of Christ is a commandment from the Father. In Leviticus 21, verses 10 through 13, God said, The Cohen who is ranked highest among his brothers, he is to marry a virgin. That applies to Yeshua, our high priest. He will not, may not marry a widow, a divorcee, or any woman who has fornicated with anyone or been profaned or a prostitute, but he must marry a virgin from among his own people. His own people is Israel. Folks, it is time. It's time to be the virgin, to get in a clean slate with Yeshua. Do we want to be in a backslidden state or divorced once from God or a widow because God is dead to us? Or are we going to be the spotless, pure bride of Christ? And we're not talking about our physical marriages here on earth, but about our spiritual state. Are our minds clear? Have we turned from wickedness? Are we wholly devoted to our bridegroom, completely dedicated you have to be Israel if you're going to be the bride. Our Lord cannot be united with anyone who is not Israel. This means the anti-Semitics in the church, well, you will not be the bride of Christ because unless you are Israel, you have no access to the bridegroom. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, for I'm jealous for you with God's kind of jealousy since I promised to present you as a pure virgin in marriage to your one husband, the Messiah. Folks, the bridegroom must have a pure bride. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 34, Likewise, the woman who is no longer married or the girl who has never married concerns herself with the Lord's affairs and how to be holy both physically and spiritually. But the married woman concerns herself with the world's affairs with how to please her husband. Now, folks, this is how we are likened to a spiritual bride rather than a married bride. When we come to the marriage of the Lamb, we're going to be co-lights with the Messiah in taking Torah to the nations. Our job right now as the virgin bride is to be holy both physically and spiritually and to clear our minds and to make our minds holy for the Lord. Let the commandments of God in the Torah dominate your life. And this is why God has warned us to guard everything we think and what we say. This is why God said to clean up our thought life along with our spiritual life. 
everything that is harbored in our hearts, everything we listen to, everything we eat, and everything we say must be censured and retained to conform to God's character, the Torah. What is our body? It's a physical containment for the spiritual person. The spiritual person is that part of us that will go back and be one with our God. Remember, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience, not physical beings having a spiritual experience. Our spirit cannot thrive without spiritual food. There's an abundance of food provided to us by God for just like he provided physical food for Israel in the desert. As we discussed moments ago, Torah food will never run out. There's an excellent illustration given by Yeshua in his parable in Matthew 25 about the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five who were foolish. This parable is about the coming of the Mashiach and the marriage of the Lamb. We just define what a virgin is. It's one who is holy both physically and spiritually. So in this parable, each virgin had lamps. What are lamps? We go to Psalm 110, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So now the lamp of each one is the Torah, the word of God. The emphasis in the parable is on the oil in the lamps that provided light which is the symbol of God's word. If we put forth God's light resulting from Torah study, we are producing eternal light. In other words, if we study the Torah and do the Torah commandments, we are co-lights with Christ. But five of the virgins did not have enough oil to last until the master came. These either did not study Torah or studied but did not do what the Torah instructs us to do. Five virgins were wise and had prepared their lamps, the word, to produce light. The five foolish virgins were advised to go and buy oil from the oil dealers before it was too late. When they returned, the bridegroom had come and the wise virgins had gone into the wedding feast with the bridegroom and the door was shut, folks. The light from the master and the lights from the lamps of the five wise virgins lit up the wedding chamber. Proverbs 10, verse 8. The wise in heart will receive commands, but a parting fool will fall. Yeshua said in Luke 6, 49, that the one who hears and does the commands of the Torah is wise, but the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. It fell quickly. Luke 6, 49 in the Berean Study Bible says this, But the one who hears my words and does not act on them is like a man who built his house on ground without a foundation. The torrent crashed against that house and immediately it fell and great was its destruction. Yeshua said in Luke eleven twenty eight, The people who hear the teaching of God and obey it, they are the ones who have God's blessing. You are only wise if you hear and obey. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear, that's the holy awe, the total infatuation with the Lord of Adonai is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline, God's instructions. The word for instruction in Hebrew is Torah. Obedience is the difference between being a fool and being a wise person. Five virgins did not have enough oil, the spirit of truth. They had the word, but they were not pursuing it in spirit and in truth. All ten virgins had the word, the lamp. But five were doers of the word and five were not. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. You can claim grace all you want, but grace without deeds is dead. Read James 24 verses 14 through 26, which in part says this. 
Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? James says, I'm going to give you an example. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, as he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. There you go. I've given you witnesses. There it is. I've given you undeniable proof that doing the commandments of God is as important or more important than belief. For you can believe in Christ, but not follow his commandments, but you can't follow his commandments and not believe. As I told you before, the Jews believe in Christ, they just don't recognize him as being the one that came here the first time. It's all about the oil, the Spirit of God. Without God, we are carnal and we chase every lust of fallen human nature. That is feeding the flesh more than the Spirit. We must feed the spirit more than the flesh. Listen, when love is the driver, obedience is no problem. It's not a burden. If you want to do the will of our bridegroom husband, you will obey the commandments. Jesus in John 6 verses 38 through 46 said that he came down from heaven not to do his own will, but the will of the Father. Galatians 6, 9, Paul said, Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we just don't give up. The wise had the spirit of truth in great abundance, and their light was strong. Now, just looking at that parable, the term the bridegroom was late is not an error, and it doesn't mean that God's late for anything. The opposite, his timing is perfect. So how come he's not here, you say? I mean, the world is certainly wicked enough, right? The reason is that as time goes on, the tests get harder. God's people are sifted. God is after the bride without spot or wrinkle. He's going to sift out the weak and the undecided. The sifting is to get a bride without spot or wrinkle. Can you stay through all that? Many will not. But let me assure you, God is not delaying because he wants us to fail. He is delaying to find the strongest believers, those who will do his will and not just hear it. He's looking for those who will make the Torah commandments their life. We have to be made worthy. We have to be sifted. We have to be tested. Those who call themselves virgins but are not really a part of the bride because they hear only will be sifted out. God's bride will always be awake and ready for his coming. He wants to see if she's awake, so he sends a heralder to stand outside her window and cry out, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and a trumpeter blows the shofar. The Lord shall descend with a shout, Paul says, with the shout of the archangel and the voice of the trumpet of God, he will be announced. And folks, this is Jewish marriage imagery. Matthew chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Open your hearts and think deeply about this. 
Judah, the Jews, have been preserving the Torah throughout the ages, and they're the oil dealers. Now is the time for us to go to and learn from our elder brothers, Judah. Don't wait until Messiah comes and then say, Oh, I didn't know I was supposed to look like Israel and be clothed with the Torah like a bride in a wedding dress. I didn't even know God's laws because my pastor told me the laws have been done away with and nailed to the cross. I didn't know that God provided the Torah for me and I was supposed to be living it. I did not know. I just don't know. But folks, now you do know. Come now and get your oil from the oil dealers. Do not wait until the wedding is on. It'll be too late. Only the ones who are prepared are the ones going in. I have nothing against the church today. In fact, I want it to do well. But it better be getting some oil from the oil dealers instead of peddling the false narratives that we don't have to obey God's commandments because we're under grace. Don't be a foolish virgin. Be a wise one. Psalm 19, verse 7. The Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring the inner person. The instruction of Adonai is sure, making wise the thoughtless. The Lord, when he comes, folks, will say to them exactly what he said to the five foolish virgins, Matthew 25, 11. Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Matthew 7, 23. Depart from me, you workers of Torahlessness, you who practice lawlessness. Yeshua is the source of life. But you don't have Yeshua unless you have the word, for they are inseparable. Unless you're doing the word, doing the lifestyle of Yeshua, you are a harlot trying to get into the kingdom of God some other way. You're trying to get access to the husband without being part of the bride. If you don't have the ketubah, that's the marriage contract from the bridegroom, you will not be spiritually married to him. 1 John 3 verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness also known as Torahlessness. The loss of blessing in life is called sin and sin can be summed up as foolish. In Revelation, we see a woman standing on God's timepiece, the moon, clothed with the sun of righteousness and having 12 crowns around her head, which means she's Israel. Then we see another woman riding the beast and drunk with the blood of the saints. That is the harlot. Don't be a harlot because her flesh is eaten and she's burned with fire. We find that in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 10 through 12. This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as refuge on the surface of the field in the plot at Jezreel, so that they shall not say, Here lies Jezebel. Rebecca, our bride symbol of the saints, had to be from Israel. Eliezer recanted the story of his mission and the house of Laban agreed that Rebecca should go with him immediately, providing Rebecca gave her agreement. This is proof that God will never force you into his will. When the time is at hand, there will be no delay of those who return to Israel. Your transport will be waiting. Eliezer fell to the ground and gave thanks to the Lord. The bride's mother asked for 10 days before Rebecca would leave. And this is because it was custom to prepare the bride. It's a gift to the bridegroom to make the bride ready. But Eliezer wanted to go quickly. So they called Rebecca in to see what she would say. And again, here it is. The bride must be willing. We must be ready. We must already have our Torah, our lamps full. Rebecca trusted God and agreed to leave right away. She was already prepared. The parting blessing from the house of Laban was that she would become the mother of millions, folks, and that has come to pass. We, the children of Israel, have indeed possessed all the foreign nations that hate Israel. 
This includes America, whose current administration has been supporting Israel's enemies while falsely telling Israel we love them and we're going to stick by them. I want to close to say that America's on the wrong side of God right now when it comes to Israel and our national sin. We can expect America to receive the curses of our own making. God's people within America must be ready to leave for Israel when the Spirit sends for us. We don't know the time. We are event watchers, not time setters. It could be America will return to the ways of God. However, other than a miracle, it appears that we've gone too far to ever return on our own. If there is one redeeming thing that might turn us around, it would be the family. American families must come together and study the Torah and rise up against the evil of their children being indoctrinated in schools into hate and having their bodies butchered. It's clear this week from the election that the evil has championed in our nation and continues to champion. We are following evil. America has not seen the light. America has not turned back to God. Take the advice of Almighty God, America, and return to Shuvah. Shabbat Shalom.